In Unit 3, we're going to take a practical look at how Land Mobile Radio Systems and Technologies enable us to communicate more efficiently and effectively. Operability, as we defined before, is our ability to communicate with the people that we need to communicate with on a daily basis during the course of normal business. Within our radios, there are certain channels or talk groups that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. The use of these channels can be local, countywide, or even regional in scope. Many times, end users may not have to change from their normal operating channel for several shifts or longer. Over time, this has created issues with users not knowing what other channels are in the radio and not understanding how to access other channels. This also creates a lack of interoperable capability with those users when they need to communicate with an outside agency on a different channel. Some examples of these day-to-day -day use channels are the county fire and law enforcement channels in which dispatch and operational activities are commonly conducted. Interoperability channels are the common nationwide channels designated by the FCC and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security that allow for communications to occur as needed and as authorized between different jurisdictions, agencies, disciplines, and levels of government. Interoperability channels are available across a variety of public safety radio bands, including VHF, UHF, 800 MHz, and others. The characteristics of an interoperability channel include common channel names, such as VCall 10, shared frequencies, and common CTCSS or PL tones. Interoperability channels are essential when operating within a unified command structure or when responding to incidents requiring the use of mutual aid resources. Additionally, the use of interoperability channels is required by all federal, tribal, state, and local public safety agencies. These requirements are documented in the National Emergency Communications Plan and the Texas Statewide Communications Interoperability Plan. In most cases, we remain on our primary channel or talk group when responding to an emergency. Most of the time, there is little need to transition to a different channel when conducting day-to-day -day operations. However, on larger scale incidents that require a multi-agency or multi-jurisdictional response, or for those incidents that require intensive tactical operations, such as traffic control, we find that everyone staying on the same channel quickly creates a problem. During these incidents, the need to communicate regularly in the course of protecting life and property in a high stress or volatile time creates congestion on the channel. While we may be focused on putting out the fire, directing traffic or other activities, dispatch must still be able to notify other agencies of emergencies that have occurred. The more traffic that we add to the channel, the less efficient and effective communications are for everyone. To alleviate this issue, we can assign additional channels by function. Tactical channels allow for communications to occur among tactical or operational resources and with an immediate supervisor. For instance, we may find the need to conduct traffic management operations on a tactical channel rather than on the dispatch channel. Command channels allow supervisors on an incident or event to communicate directly with one another without interruption by tactical operations and without interfering with the jurisdiction or agency's ability to dispatch additional calls. Air-to-ground channels may be implemented to enable communications between aircraft and ground resources. For each type of channel, an interoperability channel can be used. We'll look at more on this idea in a moment. The takeaway for now is to utilize additional channels when needed. Never try to manage a large incident or event with a single channel. Coordinated use of multiple channels ensures that those with a need to communicate can do so effectively, efficiently, and reliably. The illustration above serves as an example of how functional channels may be utilized to support the response to a wildfire incident. At the center of the illustration is the responder. Now, we know that every responder may be subject to performing different tasks depending upon where they are assigned within the incident command system. However, we can also agree that the responder had to be notified of the need to respond by dispatch. In this case, we might find that the county fire channel was utilized by dispatch to alert the firefighter of the need to respond. Once the firefighter arrives on scene, he or she typically lets dispatch know that they have arrived. This communication would occur on the fire channel as well. Now, per the requirements of ICS, the firefighter needs to check in with the incident commander or unified command in order to be assigned to the support position in which they'll operate. He or she may switch to the command channel that has been determined by the incident commander or unified command. It could be that the unified command has determined they will use B-Fire 21 as their command channel. 
Once assigned to a position, task force, or strike team, the firefighter will need to be able to communicate. In this example, we have two divisions that are working together to fight the fire. Division A consists of those folks that are using dozers and other such equipment to establish fire breaks. Division B consists of the personnel that are putting wet stuff on the red stuff or actively fighting the fire. Each division is likely to be using a different tactical channel to communicate with one another. If Division B is utilizing V-Fire 22 for tactical communications, as prescribed by the Unified Command, then the firefighter would be able to use that channel to communicate with others that he or she is working with. At the same time, using different tactical channels ensures that the two divisions are not competing for the ability to talk. In the event that air support is necessary, an air-to-ground channel can be established so that operations can be coordinated with the appropriate aircraft. Using this approach, all personnel understand how to communicate with different components of the response, yet they do not have to compete for the ability to talk. In order for this approach to work, the incident commander or unified command, or a designated representative such as the communications unit leader, must establish an incident communications plan and communicate that plan to all appropriate personnel. Now, you may be asking as to why we have to go through all of this trouble to use radios when we have these fancy high-tech cellular phones that we carry around with us. Each time that communication on an incident or event is conducted with one-on-one -on -one cellular conversations, situational awareness is dramatically reduced because no one else can hear the conversation. Creating a group call takes additional time and is therefore not an efficient solution to the issue. If we obtain information from a telephone call, we must then repeat this information to others in order to re-establish situational awareness. This too takes time and is inefficient. Additionally, relaying messages to others based on telephone conversations creates ample opportunities for the message to become distorted. Think about the game that we all played as children, the telephone game. A statement is whispered to the first person in line, and that person then turns and repeats the message to the person behind them. The recipient's ability to hear and understand the message is influenced by their attention and environmental noise. Most of the time, the message is completely different at the end of the game. Radio usage, however, allows for the appropriate personnel to listen to the message simultaneously, thereby reducing the potential for the message to be misconstrued. If routine training and the actual use of radios are not demonstrated and encouraged by department leadership, new personnel are not likely to realize the benefits or even know how to properly use radio assets. This quickly creates a serious safety issue for day-to-day -day operations event management, and large-scale incident responses. You see, effective emergency communications doesn't just come from understanding the technologies at our disposal and how the systems work. We must also focus on learning how to use our equipment the correct way. Microphones, especially those that are attached to portable radios, often give responders the most trouble. When using a microphone, regardless of whether it's attached to a portable or mobile radio, the microphone must be held close enough to the mouth for the voice to be heard. In most cases, one to two inches away from the mouth should be sufficient. Getting the microphone too close to the mouth also creates problems, as it muffles the audio and makes the message harder to understand. When using microphones, it is important to avoid transmitting in high noise environments. Typically, when in a high noise environment, such as near a running pump engine, we find the need to raise our voices and talk louder. When transmitting on a radio, this elevation in audio causes overmodulation and creates a similar, albeit louder, inability to understand the message as holding the microphone too close to the mouth does. Antennas are another source of concern relating to the quality and reliability of our communications equipment. Radios perform best when the antenna is straight up and down. This is due to how radio frequency, or RF, waves travel. It is also important to understand that the human body acts as a barrier to signal which poses problems for those who wear their radio on their belt and attempt to transmit using a microphone accessory. Just as antenna height on a tower affects the repeater's ability to cover an area, antenna height must be considered for portable radios as well. In some cases, you may find it useful to raise the radio into the air in order to maximize antenna height and reach the repeater. For all radios, especially mobile and portable radios that experience significant wear and tear over time, connectivity must be maintained. Antennas should be checked regularly for damage and tightness. If an antenna is not connected tightly or gets moisture in the connection through a damaged antenna or cable, audio quality is degraded significantly. Lastly, we want to avoid touching base station and mobile radio antennas when the radio is transmitting. 
This is because RF transmissions generate both heat and energy. Believe it or not, RF waves are physical objects that can be and are studied in physics. Higher powered radio devices, such as repeaters, base stations, and even some mobile radios, can produce enough heat and energy when transmitting that they can leave significant physical burns on the parts of the body that contact the antenna. Battery life is another one of those issues that creates problems for responders. Think about your experience with battery powered objects. If the batteries are low in your television remote, then you have to get closer to the TV in order to change the channel and eventually the remote stops working altogether. Or your cell phone that over time will no longer hold a charge. Radio batteries are no different. A low battery or a battery that has failed results in the radio having less power or not being usable at all. When a power outage is possible or expected, or when you will be operating for an extended duration in the field, ensure that your battery is charged and you have spare batteries, or that you have the ability to charge your radio while in the field. A dead battery doesn't help you on the fire ground. Also, when purchasing new radio equipment, research the product to see if the manufacturer offers alternative power options, such as AA battery holders or disposable batteries. You might also consider the use of mobile chargers or the use of a 12 volt direct current to 110 volt alternating current inverter that will enable you to use your regular radio charger in your vehicle. Making sure our equipment is in good and serviceable condition is only part of the battle. There are also some best practices that we can incorporate to ensure that we get the most from our radios and radio systems. We should make sure that the radio is on the correct channel. Make sure that the channel is clear of traffic before you begin transmitting. Keep your radio transmissions as short as possible while using plain and clear language. Remember, we are operating in a moderate to high stress environment and we can only remember so much at a time. Use proper names or unit identification. And lastly, do not use profanity or other unacceptable language. It's wrong, it's illegal, and it doesn't reflect well on you, your department, and the service as a whole. Remember, much of our communications are being monitored by citizens with scanners, and some systems are even broadcast live on the internet. Don't be that guy. You know the one. We also want to avoid the use of TIN codes or other acronyms that responders may not be familiar with. The National Incident Management System mandates that we use plain language and clear text to communicate within the Incident Command System. Also, TIN codes are not standardized between agencies. While we probably all know what a 104 means, 1036 has a lot of different meanings. You also want to check periodically to ensure that you're not accidentally keyed up and transmitting. Being keyed up ties the channel up and also broadcasts messages and discussions that you do not intend to share with the rest of the world. In line with this practice is ensuring that radios are programmed with a transmit timeout setting that allows for no more than 120 seconds or two minutes of audio to be transmitted without the push to talk key being released and pressed again to continue the message. When transmitting, try to avoid sounding excited during your broadcasts. Inflection, tone, and volume shift frequently when a person is excited. This causes the message to be harder to understand by other responders. Before broadcasting, hold the push to talk button, take a deep breath lasting one or two seconds, and then begin speaking. This calms you down and also gives the radio system time to begin rebroadcasting the message. If you are using multiple channels on an incident, say the channel name when calling. The same goes for the use of multiple repeaters. This helps you to maintain awareness of the channel in which you're using. It also allows other system owners and system users to redirect your communications to the correct channel in the event that you accidentally talk on the wrong channel. Throughout this unit, we have discussed how channels are utilized to support operability and interoperability, best practices for using radio systems and equipment, and some maintenance considerations that we should evaluate on a regular basis. Together, these concepts improve our ability to communicate reliably efficiently and effectively with other responders, agencies, and disciplines. Be sure to complete the activities below in order to unlock Unit 4. In Unit 4, we will take a look at how interoperability channels should be programmed in accordance with the Texas Statewide Interoperable Channel Plan and Memorandum of Understanding. Until then, stay safe, be aware, and keep up the great work that you do in your community.